thank you for the invitation to speak uh, to you all today from a rainy Scotland. Um, what I'd like to do is to build on what Margaret says, my organisation works very closely with her, but also I want to challenge your thinking a little bit, and I'll put that within the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, first of all, um, a little bit about um, my organisation. This is our headquarters in Glasgow. The reason I'm showing you a picture of the building is it's the first time I've seen it since March of this year, as we've all been working from home. Um, and we are a national innovation centre funded by Scottish government. Um, and what we do is we bring together um, politicians, clinicians, uh, service managers from health and care across all the organisations involved in its delivery in Scotland, uh, with academics, with industry, and with our citizens to innovate and co-design in a protected environment to develop new services that will allow us to deliver what we hope will be safe, effective and sustainable health and care services that will stand us well um, into the future. And what we do um, is we don't simply do technical innovation. Everybody thinks that we major on technology. And yes, technology is important. But what I would say to you is equally important is service innovation. What are the service models for the future? How are we going to deliver services in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And equally importantly, what are the commercial innovations? What are the business models that will allow us not just to adopt new services, new technologies, but to be able to scale them across the whole of our system. And the reason that across Europe and across the whole of the world, we haven't been successful at scaling uh, a lot of our good solid innovations are that we focus on maybe one or sometimes two of these aspects, but we seldom focus on all three together. And that is one of the key messages I'd like to share with you. So our vision is that we want Scotland's people to be able to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. And at the same time, my organisation is tasked with creating economic advantage for Scotland, for the UK and for Europe, so that our um, businesses can develop new tools and services that can address the societal challenges that we have here in Scotland, but equally they can sell those uh, on the global stage. So this is our world. This was our world before COVID. Digital tools and services were ubiquitous in our day-to-day -day lives. It's how we run our social lives. It's how we connected with our families. And over the past year, that has become even more important. Uh, yet in health and care, it has taken the global pandemic for us to accelerate the use of technology. And I'll touch on some of the reasons in a minute or two. As was said earlier in the introduction, at the moment we're spending most of our time, effort and euros on treatment and post-event care. But for the longer term, we need to focus more on prevention, detection and anticipation of illness and also on independent living. How do we keep our citizens, particularly as they get older, uh, engaged, not just in economic engagement, but also as active participants and members of their own communities. And I would suggest to you that digital tools and services have got an important part to play in delivering that. So what we describe this journey is towards next generation services. And what I mean by that, and it was again said in the introduction, it's taking the, the language of person-centered or citizen-centered care uh, to a different level. When we're looking at digital tools and services, we are using user-centered design. But what I would also suggest to you, in the future, we need to stop thinking about simply connecting our back-end government and healthcare databases. We need to do that. But what if we thought of the citizen as the point of data integration? What if we empower the citizen to take better informed health and well-being choices by supporting them to do that? 
And equally importantly, in the future, rather than spending millions of euros in artificial intelligence to support the needs of government departments or large hospitals or healthcare delivery organizations and businesses, what if we put artificial intelligence in the hands of our citizens to work on their own data, to allow them to make better informed health and well-being choices? to allow them to access services, not just health and care services, but wider government services on their own terms. We can make our systems much more effective, much more affordable, and stop some of the treacle slow pace we have at the moment, where we're wading through the challenges of cultures within uh, big businesses, and within government departments. Very easy to say, really difficult to do, but let's put this all in the context uh, of the world we live in today, the world with coronavirus. This was the architecture that we had built to take us forward into the next generation. It's based around this bit in the middle, which we call the DHI exchange layer, designed by our organization, having learned from the most advanced uh, health and care delivery systems in countries in the world. And it's a consumer facing data exchange. In the consumer environment, we can plug in uh, home monitoring, as described by Margaret. So, blood pressure management, falls detection, care coordination tools designed by the healthcare system. But equally importantly, and most importantly, plugged into that exchange layer is a personal data store where the citizen can store their own data and anything they want, consumer generated data as well as formal health data. And also plugged into our data exchange is Apple Health Kit and Google Fit. So any app that connects to these devices, that data can come and sit in the data exchange. And on the other side of our data exchange, it's plugged into our health and care systems. It's plugged into the electronic health records in the hospitals, the GPIT systems in our community healthcare services, and to a number of other government databases. And we can take consumer generated data, and if it is trusted and complies to national standards, we can shift that data into the electronic health record and likewise, we can shift data from any of our government databases and move that in to the personal data store, uh, the citizen's own version of the truth. And that system and architecture uh, we've been using for running simulations to expose to policymakers, senior clinicians and others the art of the possible. But coronavirus changed all that. It didn't just change it all for technology. But it changed even the way I'm presenting to you, because the way you can rate my introduction today is not using the Likert scale with smiley faces that we're all used to rating speakers, but we can now use the Fauci scale. And as you can see in number five, that was the poor man as he was sitting in the President Trump press conference uh, when the president suggested that we all uh, ingest bleach um, to cure ourselves of coronavirus. And I think this scale will be used by me, certainly, for some months ahead. But what has coronavirus taught us? Well, what has taught us is some simple things, things that we knew, but things that we didn't really take into our service planning and design. Governments, senior clinicians and others cannot influence individual behavior by simply recommending what people do or even legislating what people do. The amount of coronavirus circulating in Greece, in Athens, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, and anywhere else in the world is not down to the behavior of government. It is down to the behavior of individual citizens and how they act in their day-to-day -day lives. Most people comply with recommendations, but increasingly, people are reluctant to fully follow advice. What does that mean for us? Well, it means for me, let's use digital tools and services to empower people to make it easier to do the right thing by presenting information to them uh, in a form that they trust, that they can easily access and easily act on. As I said earlier, 
allow people to make better health and well-being and social behavioral choices using digital tools and services, using the techniques that the large global consumer companies have been using on us all for years to make us sell our souls to either Apple or to Samsung or to Google or to Amazon. I could go on and on and on. But they are not wrong. We in health and care and we in government are rather slow in the uptake because it's all about personalization. Before coronavirus, I said that delivering health and care services were not going to be sustainable into the medium and long term because the percentage of GDP that is consumed by health and care, it grows exponentially year on year. We are now in the reality where the delivery of health and care services is not affordable in the short term. So we need to transform services. And the way we do that is using digital tools and services when it's appropriate to do so. So the approach that we are advocating in Scotland and taking forward is to look at several key things. And these are principles. The first principle is service design principles. Any service must be predictive and proportionate. There must be a balance between the user and the system's needs. And we really need in the future to focus on citizen activated services. The technical principles which we've deployed in all our coronavirus services are about creating data only once and using it many times. Trust in distributed data and personal ownership of data to empower citizens to make them not only participants in their own care, but to deliver more of their own health and care is increasingly important. And finally, the business principles. We must really focus our time and effort in building solutions that are open, that will scale and will evolve. Let's not get tied up about products. Let's talk more about services. And we must make sure we serve the consumer and the commissioner of services at the same time. So that's what we did with our COVID portfolio, and I'm not going to talk you through the next two slides in detail, but the part that we are playing is we're focusing on the personal integration piece. We are able to link the formal health and care data um, products with consumer generated data so that we can understand the lived experience of our citizens. And we can connect that in to all of our back end systems. And we have built our architecture around about that. And as you can see in this slide in the center, you've got the blue cloud with a cog. That is the DHI data exchange, which is the central tenant of our digital COVID response in Scotland. And this is the slide in bigger format. So what we have done is we've connected our laboratory systems with our health protection systems, with our business intelligence functions, um, with our uh, track and trace systems, but equally importantly to our consumers so that our consumers can deliver more of the track, trace and monitoring and protecting functions than simply being the beneficiaries of services that have been built and developed by the state. The first thing we built was a national notification service. So this was to notify citizens if they got a negative test result um, so that they could get back to work, they could get on with their lives and they didn't need to worry. This, the features were uh, set out in the sl slide there for you. Um, it is very simple, very straightforward, um, and was embraced by our citizens very quickly. Uh, the key here was it took us six weeks to develop this from a standing start to implement it. And it's now implemented across the whole of Scotland. Like most public health systems around the world, uh, we hadn't invested in digitizing these systems at all. Most of our health protection functions were on paper. So we built a simple tracing tool that the contact tracers could use to correct structured data, to better inform service planning, and to make the follow-up of index cases uh, quicker, smoother, more seamless. The development was rolled out by July, again, very quickly across our system. 
But this was probably one of our most important things. We put a number of apps in the hands of our citizens and most European countries have done that. But what we've done is we also have invited our citizens to do their own contact tracing through the contact app prior to getting a phone call from a skilled, trained uh, health, public health professional to support contract tracing for our positive cases. They will fill in on their app uh, the contacts that they are aware of. So before they have the phone call, we know most of their contacts. They have thought through um, who they've been in contact with, with over the past few days. And what it means is that the phone contacts uh, with our advisors are much shorter, that our compliance with follow-up is much greater. And in fact, the citizens, 60% uh, of them, uh, fill in um, uh, this in advance of the phone call in a very good and comprehensive way. We also deployed a COVID clinical assessment tool into all our accident and emergency departments, into all our COVID assessment centres and into our care homes and made it available to our ambulance service colleagues. The whole idea is collecting structured data. It supports clinicians who don't normally work in infectious diseases or respiratory medicine, who've been drawn in to the management of, of COVID uh, patients to be able to collect a structured history, for that data to be recorded in a structured way, and for it to feed our back-end business intelligence systems, as well as allow our doctors to follow clear evidence-based protocols. And as I say, it was designed in a way where it could be used by doctors, nurses, paramedics, pharmacists, and even by non-clinicians, care workers working in our care home sector uh, to support the management uh, of our patients. So these are the timeline that's taken us from development for some of these products. From a standing start, 51 days for the notification service. From a standing start, our contact tracing tools, 41 days from thinking about what we were going to do to deploying it into live. That's not just the technical development. That was the service redesign and the underlying support of governance to make it all work. Why was that possible? It was possible because we had an architecture that was a key enabler. And when I usually talk about architecture, people glaze over. It's not important. Well, the only way water comes out of your taps is if you've got good plumbing in your city and in your home. The only way we can turn data into intelligence is if we've got good supporting ICT architecture. But we need to look to next generation systems. So in the future, don't always celebrate the past. Challenge your thinking. Learn what's happened over the next last 12 months and let's build a future in collaboration together. Thank you very much for your time.